Okay. Hi, Candice. I am so Hello. excited. I feel like this has been long overdue. I've been watching you on Instagram and you put out such good, valuable content. Like I can tell that you put a lot of thought, you put a lot of time and effort into creating what you create. It's like valuable. Like everybody should follow you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> I'm going to read your proper bio so that everybody knows exactly what you do and I don't miss anything out. Okay. So Candice is the woman behind Nurture Your Vagina on Instagram. Follow her. She is a physiotherapist by trade and she practices in the field of pelvic health and wellness. In other words, she's a physio for your bits. <laughs> She manages all of the symptoms below the belt. And honestly, I didn't even know that this was a thing until recently. So I'm, I'm so excited about this conversation. But she spends most of her days assessing, treating, and chatting about subjects that are all too often brushed under the rug, pun intended. Those things that we're too scared to talk about, she is not scared. So you're soon going to know that she's very passionate about changing this narrative. And outside of physiotherapy, she is a pelvic and sexual health coach to international clientele. Candice started the Nurture platform with an intention to empower followers through education whilst normalizing important and underserved conversations and breaking down taboo in the pelvic and sexual health world. And she does that. On her Instagram page, you'll see she talks about all the things that begin with P, Pee, poo, pleasure, pain, periods, perimenopause, yeah. postmenopause. And honestly, if you love my style, you will love Candice because she's not scared. She says it how it is. She like puts photos up that are sometimes going to shock you. She, she can draw like a vagina very well too. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's just, yeah, I really think every woman should be following you. So welcome, Candice. I'm so excited to chat to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying the Instagram page and I absolutely I resonate with you. I really enjoy yours too. And I think that you're doing a world of good for all of your followers Aww. and all those that, well, all those yet to come. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, this, these conversations need to be had. And I think I can see that the conversation is changing. and People are ready for this stuff. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. A lot more receptive and, you know, acknowledging the the disparity that there has been for yeah totally. all of time <laughs> yeah for all of time and it's actually quite shocking when you learn how recent some of these scientific discoveries are when you know, this is like essential stuff how did we not know this <laughs> yeah, and so for yeah. that reason I wanted to start by asking you something that may seem very very basic but I think a lot of us don't quite understand what exactly is the pelvic floor so yeah, not a, not a silly, not a basic question at all. It is always good to start with a foundation. You know, I'm all for having a good foundation of education in and around your body. And what I always say is that you don't know what you don't know. So mm -hmm. if no one's ever told you, no one's ever taught you, how are you supposed to know that your concerns are a problem or not? And whether mm -hmm. they just, you know, common or is it normal? So always good to start with the, the foundation. So I'm going to bring in my little pelvis that I've got here. Okay. So this is your, your pelvic rim, okay? well, your, your pelvic ring, really. Um, so this is the inlet, there's the outlet. Let me just get this little balloon out. I use it for all sorts of things. Okay, so <laughs> your pelvic floor sits at the base of your pelvis. Your pelvis sits at the base of your trunk, and it sits at an anterior tilt like this. So mm -hmm. if you're standing sideways, and here's your bum, here's your tummy, and um, this is what would contribute to that nice lower back curve that's also often kind of thought to be a problem. Mm. So pelvis sits anteriorly like that. Okay, pelvic floor is at the bottom and then your pelvic organs are going to sit resting in the pelvic floor, sus suspended by ligaments okay. and fascial connective tissue. So pelvic floor is a bowl of muscle. So now this is you looking kind of between someone's legs that slings from um, each of your sit bones and then from your coccyx at the back to your pubic symphysis at the front. Right. So now I'm going to use my hands to kind of show you how it works. Okay. So it sits, it sits almost like a bowl like this, right? And at the bottom, we've got, we've got openings for mm -hmm. your anus, your urethra and your vagina. Right. So the pelvic floor is um, being a collection of muscles that function just like any other muscle in the body to, to kind of contract and relax. But 
when they're doing so, they're going to contract to kind of close off these holes. Yeah. So think of stopping wind, stopping stool, stopping wee, um, or relaxing and letting go to open up and lower down to, to allow the passage of urine, allow the passage of, of a stool, but also relaxing and letting go to allow a penis or to allow um, a toy or a speculum to be able to penetrate into the pelvic floor. Okay. So this is often where, where we can start to identify by dysfunction you know if the pelvic floor isn't doing this motion of relax and contract through its mm. full range of motion that is when we might start to see instances of urinary incontinence constipation leaking right. stool pain during intimacy lack of sensation during intimacy mm. all of those types of things yeah um so yeah a very a very simple kind of summary but the, there's your pelvic floor muscles there it is. and this is how it is um oh, a little bit, a little bit of an avulsion there. Um, it, this is how it's kind of shaped at the bottom of your of your pelvis, and it's it's also termed or thought of as a a bowl or a trampoline of okay. muscle at the base of your pelvic floor because it works with everything around it. Right. And um, what we can say is pretty much when when you breathe. So this is your respiratory diaphragm at the top, and this is your pelvic floor at the bottom. Mm -hmm. When you breathe in, your pelvic floor lets go, and you oh. pause, when you exhale, it contract. It doesn't really contract up, but it just it kind of kind of springs back up. So it okay. has this motion in connection with everything around it. Um, but I think you can tell I could <laughs> I could speak for days about it. But I think yeah, I think that a good kind of a good summary as to what is happening in the pelvic floor and, mm. and where it is and how it would, um, how it works really. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that is, it is fascinating. That's a really good, like foundational understanding of where it is, what it does. Mm. And what are some common misconceptions that you hear about the pelvic floor? Well, there are many, there's unfortunately <laughs> way too many. Um, there's this kind of idea and most things stem from our patriarchal background and um, there's this idea that tighter is better. Yeah. You know, we, we aim and we strive for a tight vagina yeah. and tight vaginas are often the source of a lot of pain and discomfort. Um, mm -hmm. And that's definitely shouldn't be what we kind of <laughs> going towards and what we, it shouldn't be our goal. So, right. so that's definitely one of the biggest ones. Um, it, and what this results in is a lot of women kind of just doing Kegels consecutively. You kind of feel like, yes. oh, if I've had a child, I better start doing my Kegels. And you kind of walk around with your pelvic floor um, tension like this the whole day. Yeah. Kind of um, and this this can, can result in problems. And then because this topic is so taboo and, and it's so underdiscovered and and avoided in conversation all too often mm -hmm. women might self-diagnose and say okay oh my word i'm leaking urine when i cough laugh sneeze run jump or jump on the trampoline so i'm going to start doing my heels i'm mm -hmm. going to just clench the i'm going to work with it yeah that can often be the source of of the problem that you wow. are concerned about okay yeah so, so there's this idea that we just need to strengthen and tighten everything tight, up everything but, tight yeah yeah, but actually, need to be flexible. And okay, yeah. so I've yeah. had a lot of women um, coming to me asking me what to do. Like they're jumping on a trampoline and they're peeing themselves, or you know they are doing workouts, especially jumping and running, where they're so embarrassed because they just yeah. you know urinary incontinence. What can what can women do about that then? If it's not Kegels, if Kegels isn't the answer, what what is the answer? So, so there, there can be very many things involved. And I would say very first point of call is chat to a pelvic floor physiotherapist because they, we, we, we need to, each, and, each individual person really needs to have mm -hmm. a, a full assessment and it is the symptoms and, and the, the causatives are different for every person. So we would definitely need to um, identify your specific concerns yeah. and how it's impacting your daily life um, and a biopsychosocial um, point of view, you know, it doesn't, it's not, these types of symptoms don't necessarily just impact our, our function mm -hmm. or, um, but they, they often have an impact on our, the way we view ourselves, our yeah. body image, our emotional capacity, our psychological, um, you know, the impact we're having on ourselves as well as all those around us. So yeah. definitely go and see, speak to someone that, that is a specialist in the field, um, mm -hmm. such as myself, but, but there yeah. are very many 
and pelvic floor physios out there. Um, so we would need to make sure that this pelvic floor is going through its full range of motion. So we right. would, you know, we've been taught okay, to clench and kegel all day. But if you were to walk around with your hand in a fist like this all day, mm. you wouldn't expect to function very well. If Correct. I need to relax and let go to reach something, I wouldn't be able to do so because my hand is now stiff and tight and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So same thing with the pelvic floor. We need to learn. We need to acknowledge, okay, are you clenching? Are you not? Are you able to relax and let go fully? Or are you kind of only let, letting go half? Mm -hmm. And then we need to incorporate strength um, in a very functional manner. So we would need to make sure that you are incorporating a, a pelvic floor activation at the right time because okay. oftentimes, our, oftentimes our timing kind of goes out and when you think you're clenching, you're actually like bearing down. Okay. Um, this, yeah, the really, really common postpartum, we, we develop a bit of a disconnect um, and we need to learn how to re-engage and, and how to utilize these muscles in, appropriate, in an appropriate manner. Yeah. So, um, yeah, first point of call would be go and see a pelvic floor physiotherapist make sure that you are able to connect to your pelvic floor. You're able to relax it through its full range of motion and then contract it with, with both power, strength, and endurance, just like right. we would for any other muscle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as opposed to the, the common kind of thought process of, of, you know, I don't know it, I don't understand it, so I'm going to ignore it, and I'm just, I'm too scared to go there. You know, it's too yeah. taboo. Uh, and, and allowing things to, like we said, you know, get brushed under the rug. Um, yeah, we need to bring things out in the open because there's professionals out there that are are capable of of making some yeah, change. This isn't this something is that, that people need to live with. Like you say, the 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 knock on effects cover so many things that can prevent you from wanting to exercise or restrict you when you're having fun or what you want to wear. Like I think a lot of women just think, oh well, this is what happens either when you get older or after you've had a baby. This is what happens. That's yeah. how it is yeah. now. And it doesn't have to be because like you say, it's a living functional muscle. It's part of us and it can be healed. Yes, exactly. I was actually ch chatting to, to a client online this morning and we were saying, you know, how, how these circumstances make you in a group of women, you'll say, don't make me laugh, you know, or you'd say, oh, I can't come play with you outside. And oh, I mean, those yeah. are most essential parts of our, our, of our being is being able to laugh and laugh out loud and really, oh my you know, gosh. laughter is medicine. And if we're stopping ourselves from doing that, it's not just the pelvic floor that is that is involved. Mm. It, it becomes a, a full full being experience um, that we need to work and with. Yeah. I have witnessed women. I mean, I can just think of my mum right now, like, oh, don't make me laugh. You know, like, please don't make me laugh. And it actually is so sad. But it just feels yeah. like normal. Of course, you can't make her laugh, you know, but ha ha ha, she's going to be her pants. Ha ha ha. But it's actually not very funny. <laughs> No, yeah, exactly, exactly. And we don't realize it's very subconscious. Um, like I said, you don't know what you don't know. You don't realize that you are, are putting yourself, you're restricting yourselves, yourself in, in this manner. Yeah. Um, yeah, so quite a, quite a profound uh, realization. And it's definitely, this the public physio is definitely, it's a very deep, um, it's not like, it's not like a lot of other physiotherapy um, practices, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's really deep really you really really connect with people um in, in a very different way because we are trying to get you to connect with a part of your body that is so integrally involved in every phase and stage of your life you know your menstrual cycle taboo mm -hmm. um sex taboo mm -hmm. um pregnancy you know a lot of it's not discovered childbirth yeah. also you know taboo, cesarean versus natural delivery yeah the, 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 we connecting with a part it's like connecting with a phantom limb and, and not really yes. knowing where to start to get so we have to utilize um very creative ways to to get our patients to really and our clients to to really connect with themselves on a very deep level yeah absolutely um, it's not like a bicep is it <laughs> No, no, you can't see it. You can't see this contract and relax. You don't know if it's sitting like this or sitting like that. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's um, not like you go around very, comparing, very, look at my bicep. You don't like, check out how strong, check out how far I can relax my pelvic floor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I dare say that when you go to a gym, you know, just lie on the floor and do your kegels and someone walks up to you, man, sorry, what are you doing? Do my kegels. <laughs> can't you yeah, tell? You should check um, these, these, these should check it out. So strong. <laughs> Do you want to feel? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I need to, before um, 
before I forget and get distracted, I, another thing that I really need to bring up, um, a misconception about the pelvic floor, is that um, vaginal delivery is going to ruin and destroy your pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. and cesarean section is going to save your pelvic floor because it's, it really couldn't be further from the truth. Both mm -hmm. have um, significant, you know, potential risks for the pelvic floor. Yes. And it's a lot more to do with the pregnancy itself. I mean, not, okay. No matter which way you go, you cannot avoid nine months of a growing baby sitting on your pelvic floor for sure. and, and the hormones that are involved and the breastfeeding that comes mm -hmm. afterwards and the hormonal changes that, that go with that too. So, um, that's definitely a misconception and our, our choices that we make with regards to to delivery need need to be educated choices mm -hmm. um and we need to have a sense of autonomy in those choices and it should be a decision that we make and not one that and I'll, another medical professional makes for you. Brilliant. So yeah, I have to say that. Because yeah, I'm so glad that. you brought that up. And me, I mean, I have had two vaginal deliveries. And for me, I it was a big concern. And, you know, you hear people, especially when they're pregnant, you know, laughing at the bride, for example, and they're like, oh, no, you know, don't do it that way. You'll get ruined. Like, and the men kind of get involved, like, ha, 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 have yeah. a cesarean. What do they say? Some, oh, it's, maybe it's not very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> as well as a phrase, but I can't, I can only remember the end of the phrase. Anyway, um, I remember being worried about that, but I was quite, I, w I wanted a natural birth if I could. I understand that some people don't have a choice, but for me, yeah. I'm quite a small person. I've got, you can tell me if this is, this is true, but I've got size three feet. So my midwife was telling me my pelvis is too small to deliver vaginally. Anyway, I proved her wrong twice, but, um, <laughs> but I remember specifically after having my first child, I was only 24. I wasn't very clued up about anything. I remember lying on the bed, on the hospital bed and attempting to do a Kegel. <laughs> I felt like, I, I literally, it just felt like there was no response it was such a scary feeling, but it was, I mean, I'm talking minutes after birth. It just was like, okay. sorry, I'm out of here. This I'm out of action. And so I was yeah. very worried that I'd wrecked everything. And very naturally, I mean, and I had another baby 18 months later. And I just have to tell you in between then it healed beautifully. And now I'm, I've got a trampoline. I jump on my trampoline. I don't pee my pants. Yay. But I'm very, yeah, yeah. I'm very in touch with my pelvic floor. And so I, I can advocate for that. There's no, I'm not wrecked. <laughs> no. Yeah. Things no. And, and, and yeah. Yeah. A m majority of my patients aren't either, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's oftentimes it comes, you know, you might experience pelvic floor dysfunction from, from other things, from a period of stress in your life, from a change of mm -hmm. hormones, from, breastfeeding versus not breastfeeding when you transition onto and off of breastfeeding it, it's Absolutely. not necessarily you know childbirth that's gonna wreck you yes. um really. yeah just really couldn't be further from the from the truth but yeah. the fact that you you know moments after childbirth kind of lay there and you're like oh my word okay let me let me let me fix this thing <laughs> <laughs> that that is that's part of the problem that we, we need to get because because yeah. like you said, you go to a bry and if you have a vaginal delivery, the men are like, oh my word, there goes the vagina. Yes. The sex life is gone. Yes. Um, but for very many patients of mine, their sex life is a hell of a lot better after having Ooh, a vaginal really. delivery. I've just got um, the phrase. <laughs> the phrase is, have a Caesar, save the beaver. Have you ever heard yeah. of that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone, <laughs> it's a myth. I posted about it recently and someone, someone <laughs> yeah, definitely a myth. Someone, someone sent it to me as an inbox message. So it was only like uh, about a month or so ago that I heard that for the first time. And I had such a good laugh. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely not the truth. It's not, not the truth. Not these things, the these things yeah. are designed for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad you covered yeah. that one. That's a, that's a huge misconception. Definitely, definitely. Our oh, one that definitely needs a little bit more limelight um and some attention yeah <laughs> no doubt about it one thing that i've heard or i understand about the pelvic floor is that it's it helps to support your internal organs so it supports your uterus supports your bladder and is that correct yes definitely so um like i said in the beginning your pelvic floor is like a bowl mm -hmm. and your pelvic organs sit this is your uterus pelvic mm -hmm. organs sit in in that bowl right yeah. so 
that your, your organs are always suspended by, by, by connective tissue. Let me do that. Okay, so your organs are kind of suspended by uh, connective tissue in that pelvic ring, right? And what can happen with, with surgical procedures, with uh, pregnancy itself, with the delivery, um, these, these supportive connective tissue um, can be compromised. So okay. what might happen is that this is now ruptured or being cut through or is now torn from a variety of reasons. Um, and now this, this, like, this organ is sitting a little bit lower in mm -hmm. that pelvic cavity. Mm -hmm. So, and or we can obviously have rupture on both sides and all around, and that would result in that organ sitting a lot lower. So then the pelvic floor takes even more responsibility to, to support those organs. Mm. Um, and as females, we've got, we've got a nice wide, our urogenital opening or triangle is, is wide because we need to get a baby through there, right? Mm -hmm. Where, and, and we've got this quite a narrow perennial body. So what can happen is as those organs then descend, you, you can end up with pelvic organ prolapse, um, which is those organs sitting nice and low, or not nice and low, but they sit low in the vaginal cavity. Mm. And sometimes you can see them at the entrance and sometimes you can see them outside of the body. Um, wow. which, which once scary. again, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it can definitely be scary. And this is one of the things that really, um, there's a lot of fear mongering around it with regards to, to delivery processes once again. Um, but there are a lot, a lot of lifestyle changes that we can implement mm -hmm. that can reverse a prolapse. Oh, okay. So if, if, a, if the, we're not going to get those ligaments to, to now all of a sudden come back into, into their supportive functions up here anymore, you know, but if you are, exercising on a daily basis and you hold your breath if you um are pushing because you're constipated on the loo all the time mm. if those types of pushing your urine out all mm. of those things are going to result in extra pressure down on these organs which is going to exacerbate okay. something like a prolapse and, and the descent of those organs into a vaginal cavity so if we can change those lifestyle factors teach you how to engage the pelvic floor strengthen mm. that pelvic floor from below that is going to completely change the way, the, the supportive capacity for the pelvic floor at the bottom to support those organs. And then we're not necessarily, you know, redoing those ligaments at the top and those, that support, supportive tissue, but we are making sure that there is no exacerbation of, of that um, already existing prolapse. Because right. it's not necessarily a pelvic floor dysfunction that causes prolapse, it's more mm -hmm. of a connective tissue issue. Wow. Um, where the connective suspensory tissue is no longer as supportive as it was, but the pelvic floor can really, really change things in teaching you how to support and um, in an appropriate manner. Yeah. Wow. So you don't have any risk. I didn't yeah, know yeah. that about the connective tissue. I'm, that's so interesting. Yeah. Thank you for yeah, explaining it that. It doesn't look exactly like that, but it's a, a general, <laughs> so long as you, <laughs> you get the, you get the gist of it. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's really, it does make sense. It's kind of crazy to think that our organs are just held up by little bits of tissue. Like, I don't know what I thought that I don't really know how I thought they stayed in their places. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, if, if you think about it, you know, your, your, your bowel, it, it's suspended and it stays in this beautiful pattern. Um, yeah, how? You know, Ooh, all really good sitting of it. Like Everything is, is supported and like your heart is in the same place. You know, it doesn't all just go... Uh, Candice, down. you've just totally changed my world now. I'm thinking about my organs. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that they would just be in a slump, wouldn't they? If... Okay. <laughs> They're not, not all just shoved in there. You've blown my <laughs> mind. <laughs> Like what uh, do they attached yeah. to? I guess to the ribs. Do the ribs hold up some of the? Uh, uh, I would. <laughs> uh, I can I can send you a picture of connective tissue. It's, I it's need attached to everything. Oh. It literally, this is the wrong description. But if you imagine like a spider's web inside your body, yeah, connecting everything. Like is it like the fascia? Is that what the fascia is? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is blown because I knew we had fascia. I didn't really know how important it was. Oh yeah, it, it's essential. And it's becoming, we are starting to realize more and more through research how important it is because 
before with surgical procedures, it, it was very much considered, you know, everything's just in layers and everything's just in there. So yeah. we would cut some blood open and then just open up and just take this out and put it there and put it back in, oh my not realizing that there's a reason why your bowel is connected to your quadratus lumborum muscle, which is going to, you know, if you operating or you create them, um, uh, cutting through your quadratus lumborum, then we might have constipation issues after that, you know? Oh my so, gosh, Candice. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure my mum won't mind me talking about her, but my mum has had an awful lot of abdominal surgery, like a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm hysterectomy, cesareans, mm-hmm. bowel removed, all kinds of things. And she has a lot of complications and prolapse. And it all does make sense. It kind of, yeah, it's fascinating and sad. Um, mm-hmm. Her surgeries have been over the course of like, 20 or 30 years so I suppose as medical advances have been made they've maybe been more gentle but perhaps some of her later issues who knows it's just interesting to me to consider that yeah it is fascinating really I've just learned a lot (laughs) I didn't think I was going to be learning so much so thank you okay well now is as good a time as any to talk about how the pelvic floor helps or hinders during sex? How does it impact our pleasure? Does it impact our pleasure? Most certainly without, without fail. Um, so this is, this is what's led me into specific, you know, it's a niche within a niche. So mm. I'm a public floor physio, but I'm specifically interested in sex and sexual dysfunction yes. and et cetera. So it's, also very much so underserved. I mean, pelvic floor in general is underserved, but yeah, sexual health within that is even worse. So, so totally. um, pelvic floor is most certainly involved. So when I when I spoke about the pelvic floor earlier, how we have to have this ability to relax and let go to allow for penetration, that's kind of the most obvious uh, connection between the two. You know, mm. in order in order to achieve penetrative intercourse, we need to have this ability to relax and let go and allow for penetration Mm -hmm. if that is the preference um and sometimes there can be scar tissue you know there can be spasm there can be weakness um and we don't have the ability to relax and let go and we might end up with symptoms such as just generalized dyspareunia which is pain during sex vaginismus inability to achieve penetrative intercourse with a lot of pain um it can cause provoke vestalodynia a few a few things that, that that this this inability to relax and let mm. go can result in, uh, well, can impact um, sex in itself, penetration mm-hmm. in itself. So that would be the most obvious one, but definitely something that needs to um, be brought up would be that, you know, because this area is taboo, because this area is under under discussing, we really don't we really don't know very much about it in a, in a personal capacity. Often, oftentimes, we don't realize what's going on there. A lot of us have never taken a mirror and looked between our legs yeah. and really know what's going on in that area. So, um, if we don't have the ability to connect to your pelvic floor, so that a lot of what I do is is helping clients or patients to to connect to the area mm-hmm. and identify what exactly is happening mm-hmm. um are you stuck in attention dysfunction or is there a weakness you know are you cleaning in response to the the conversation and around intimacy because of some history of trauma that you might have had what exactly is going on yeah. um so, so getting us to connect to the pelvic floor so that it's not a phantom limb it's a part of your body and you can say okay, we're going to relax and let go. Yes. Okay. I'm feeling anxious. Why am I feeling anxious? Let me resolve those symptoms. Let's, mm-hmm. let's have that, that adaptive behavior. I don't know if you saw on my stories the other day, in one of the quickies that I did, I was talking about having an adaptive behavior as well as opposed to a maladaptive behavior. So, you know, we, we behave in response to some form of stimuli. So uh, it might be something, you know, pain, we might yeah. feel a sense of pain and we're going to behave, we're going to respond to that. And we, we have this, um, response initially that might tension and get us away from that pain and that's an adapter that's a good behavior to have but over time with repeated exposure to certain stimuli what we might end up having is a maladaptive behavior and all of a sudden this which was originally good for you and protecting Mm -hmm. and saving you is no longer serving you Mm -hmm. and now we're stuck like this and now we want to relax and let go which which can become part of the problem so So having the ability to relax and let go to allow for penetration, but then also having the ability to to connect to the pelvic floor so we can identify what exactly is happening yeah. um, in the pelvic region. Um, it's a really holistic approach. You're incorporating everything. 
yeah 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 making sure that that, that we yeah and then and then i suppose um with with this we can speak about being able to experience pleasure versus being able to experience pain right. um and and weighing out so i have a lot of vaginismus patients that have you know use dilators and then they now feel like they're doing well but and the day they having sex and that they feel like yes i'm having sex but then when you yeah. ask them okay yeah you're getting a penis and vagina but is it pleasurable yeah um and that's what it should be and, and and shifting our focus and shifting our intentions to to having pleasure um over the experience of pain in order to just you know satisfy a partner's needs yeah um, or just put the box to say yes for I got sure the so it's moving yeah, the goal so from just being able to receive a penis and thinking yes i'm winning to actually enjoying penetration if yeah. that is your preference and as i understand yes. it if we move i guess we're going to be moving towards orgasm now if your pelvic floor has its full range of mobility then you're able mm -hmm. to experience kind of stronger feelings like because of that tension and contraction, which is kind of an orgasm, <laughs> that if, you're, if you've got a, a supple pelvic floor, then I understand that that is going to boost your experience. Is that correct? Yes, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say supple. I, I would say more of a functional, you know, functional. you have the ability to completely relax, relax as well as completely um, okay. relax. So supple or too flexible, um, okay. you know, or too lax and loose, you know, yeah. that might be great the splits but it's not very functional <laughs> because you can't stand up okay um, fair enough <laughs> so, so that might be more associated that that lacks loose you know overstretched type sensation you know okay uh, that might be more associated with pain it might be more associated with lack of sensation and orgasmia inability to achieve um or orgasm mm -hmm. um then to, on the topic of orgasm being a rhythmical contraction of the pelvic floor in the uterus i think it's 0.8 seconds apart or something like that um there is no specific research to say that pelvic floor exercises will improve your orgasm mm -hmm. there's been a lot of kind of like looking into it um, mm -hmm. but we can almost just extrapolate from that and hypothesize that doing pelvic floor exercises is going to improve orgasm yeah. why because when you're doing that you are improving blood flow, you're improving your connection, you're improving your awareness yeah. um, of the pelvic floor. So it's not the Kegels itself and the muscle bulk, but it's more to do with this connection, the awareness, the, the functional ability of the pelvic floor mm -hmm. um, and the blood flow that is that, that may potentially help with achieving yes. orgasm. Absolutely, yeah. I love that. Like the blood flow is everything and all the nutrients down that are getting sent down there as well. Like the blood is like yeah, yeah. all the goodness in so, there. So I mean our, our clitoris, so so the, the process that 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 initiates um engorgement um so that we can get a tumescent uh, clitoris is nitric oxide. So exercise yeah. is going to um promote the production of nitric oxide that's gonna um initiate this tum this this swelling or this engorgement, which is mm. going to allow you to to get that engorged tissue, you know, if, yeah. if we have so little blood flow, if we have tissue restrictions and mm -hmm. adhesions, they, yeah, we may not have as much blood flow, we may not have as much engorgement, mm -hmm. and we not, may not experience as much pleasure as we uh, could um, if there was blood flow, et cetera, in that, in mm. that area. Yeah. And nitric oxide, you said, can be um, stimulated by exercise, can also be stimulated by like laughter and like having fun, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, even in our diet, making sure that we, I mean, there's, loads of products out there but having a, a really nutritious diet full of greens etc and beetroot and there's a, quite a few supplements that, that improve nitric oxide but all of these things are going to um, improve this function yes. so yeah a very holistic view of it um mm -hmm. it's not it's not eagles it's not this old school thing thought of okay pelvic floor physio, okay, what am I going to do? I'm just going to Kegel. I'm going to sit in my car. When I get to the robot, I'm going to Kegel, Kegel, Kegel. kegel, and kegel. Gonna, no. <laughs> I love it. It's not going to improve your pelvic floor function if you just 
doing kegels and isolation when you're sitting at the robot it needs to be part of your life yes okay so you have kind of given us a lot of hints as to what we can do then to improve our pelvic floor function and um that includes looking at your diet looking at your exercise and things like that to inc- improve the circulation um and bring mm-hmm. the nitric oxide but what then can people do on a daily basis to take care of their pelvic floor and can we look and first of all as we're on the subject when it comes to improving the amount of pleasure they experience during penetration um so, so having the ability so, so i would start always with education so this okay. is a really great kind of start you know education knowing what what it is and where it is mm-hmm. if someone says to you oh, okay this is where it is what does it do? What does it do during sex? It needs to have the ability to relax. So having that education and that understanding and then having the ability to connect to your pelvic floor, mm-hmm. um, you know, is there a problem there? Go and seek help for it. Yes. Go and chat to a professional that knows what they're doing and, and resolve those symptoms. Don't leave them un, undis, you know, undiscovered and untreated because yes. there is effective and conservative treatment out there. So yeah. education about it, seeking help for, for the problems that you're experiencing connecting to your pelvic floor, identifying what exactly is going on there and having that awareness because this awareness is going to improve your ability to connect to your pelvic floor during intimacy. So in knowing, am I contracting? Am I, am I fearful? Or am I relaxed? And am I enjoying this? You know, um, what I get most of my patients to do is have the ability to to connect to their pelvic floor so that when they engaging in intimacy with their partner, they're not, you know, thinking, okay, school's lunch boxes mm. tomorrow. Okay. Okay, that one's actually in trouble because of this. What am I going to do about that at work? This was yes. stressful today. Being present, mm-hmm. you know, we need to have that ability to be present. And if we have this old school dissociative thought about our pelvic region, mm-hmm. then we are not going to enjoy intimacy. We not. We need to have the ability to say, "Oh, okay, that feels good." Um, improve your introspection, your awareness of your internal physiological state. Yeah. Hey, I can feel the swelling. I can feel mm-hmm. the pulsating. That feels tingly. That makes me feel good. As opposed to lunch boxes, schools, to-do list, you know. Yeah, and what am I going to make for dinner? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so having that ability to connect so that you can be present in, mm-hmm. in that instance. And then being more kind of what you can do to your pelvic floor, um, kind of direct, would be doing exercises and when i say exercises i'm not saying clenching stuff i'm saying both the whole relax as well as contract so incorporating pelvic floor into your functional daily life into your exercise routine so doing specific routines and there's loads on my instagram page about about relaxing pelvic floor learning how to let go learning what does let go feel like identifying oh my gosh my right bum is really really tight let me do some more work for that let me help let that go knowing that whatever's happening in my bum is going to impact impact that right side pelvic floor right. as well so yeah. you can have you know is this scar tissue can we work on that what can we do can we do certain um uh, manual treatment uh, self-treatment can we yeah. use specific stretches to help with that that's going to improve the way everything works together like we said in the beginning yeah um so yeah breath work along with pelvic floor work into your daily routine yeah wonderful Which, yeah, there's loads on, on my Instagram page. At yeah. CD. Thank you. That is so interesting. And then you spoke a little bit earlier about um, understanding not to push down when you're weeing, not to push down when you're pooing. Like what can we do there? Then when we're go- using the bathroom and we feel the urge to push, what should we do instead? Like what, what do you recommend there? So, so this, this comes in with the idea of, being able to connect your pelvic floor to the extent where you know whether it's relaxed or contracted. Mm -hmm. So if your pelvic floor is kind of innately just tense like this and you sit on the loo and you, you need to pass urine or pass a stool, but you don't connect your pelvic floor enough. So you don't actually know that it is relaxed. Yeah. Then yeah, you're going to need to push. Mm. But if you connect your pelvic floor and you know what relax feels like, Mm. then you would literally just sit on the loo, relax your pelvic floor, make sure you're breathing into your belly and you should feel the passage of urine and and, and stool a lot easier. With regards to more bowel movements as opposed to um, urinary function, you can put a a little step underneath your feet. And there's a video on my Instagram. So you're raising your feet up. Yeah, yeah, I think I labeled it um, lockdown constipation because I had so many people that were struggling with constipation. Um, 
uh, where, you, where you have your feet up on a step, your knees are higher than your hips, and that helps your pelvic floor to, to let go, which allows the passage of a stool a lot yeah. easier. Um, but if, if you were to do one thing for both urine and, and, and stool, it would be breathe. Breathe. <laughs> so the most of the time we kind of be bearing down. <gasps> as if we, it's so true. We, then you're going to have a lot less of a negative impact on your pelvic floor because yeah. you don't want any breath. I mean, especially when it comes to prolapse, you don't want to hold your breath for anything. Um, you don't want to bear down for anything. You want to make sure that you connect and you're able to let go. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. so obvious when you say it, that just let go. When you we, it should just be like a, like, I know it's not the case for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I've witnessed people not being able to do that, not being comfortable, but you're right. If your pelvic floor is super tense and tight and the only way you feel you can get urine out is by forcing it through, then that obviously is not a healthy environment in your pelvic region that it's yeah. really important to learn to relax for that reason. Because if we do that over and over again for years, then ultimately we are damaging the pelvic floor. We're damaging that connective tissue and causing issues that can really, really impact the quality of our life actually when we get to a certain age. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what we've got, we've got reflexes in place in our body. So just like your knee jerk reflex, right? Mm. In our pelvic floor, there's communication that goes on between our brain, our bladder, and our pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And if we are consistently, you know, holding urine for too long, if yeah. we are pushing urine out, if we are overfilling our bladder, if we mm -hmm. empty, emptying our bladder too frequently, we're messing up all these reflexes. Yeah. And our body doesn't. It, it almost, we we've changed the instruction. We've changed the, the instruction manual. Right. And um, things are not going to work very well because now you've taken out your innate learning and you've you've gone and messed it up and, and yeah. changed it so if there's problems i would definitely say just speak to a public physio yeah. because it's a lot more complex than just yeah. saying okay you need to relax you need to contract because sure you need a one-on-one -on -one assessment um yeah I fully understand it that. Yeah. Can be a lot more complex and it can be different reflexes that you would need to look at, you know, mm. and identify, you know, is it, is it a problem, you know, in one specific area of your life? Mm -hmm. And is that one little thing causing all of these symptoms? Okay, mm -hmm. we just fix that one thing, then all of a sudden, all the, the urine, you, you know, weighing too often at night, the frequency goes, the mm. leaking goes, all of those things. So, yeah, that the is the most very effective way. Yeah, yeah, go and see a professional. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to just, if you don't mind, to just ask you a little bit about peeing too often. Like, can, you know, preemptive peeing, like if you're nervous, you know, if you, some ladies, especially if they've experienced leaking, I say ladies yeah. because I don't talk to men about their peeing. <laughs> I haven't done for a while. But you know, when you're amongst friends and like, you know, they might feel nervous that they can't see a bathroom, they need to figure out where the bathroom is and they preemptively pee all the time. Like, that can cause a problem in the long term, can it? What one hundred percent? Yeah, it can cause a problem long term and short term. So you are once again you you are interrupting these natural reflexes and these urges that your body has. Our body is so perfectly designed in the mm. sense that you know you get an urge, you know, okay, I need to, I'm going to need to empty my bladder at this point in time. Um, so when we're going too often, we are teaching our bladder the wrong thing so we what happens is your your bladder falls up to about 40 percent and that's when you get your first urge to to urinate and typically we should say you're only 40 percent full right relax you know yeah. carry on with our life relax and then at a later stage you get another urge and it's the second urge that's when you should you should empty your bladder and that's when you should sit on the loo relax oh. your pelvic floor and allow your bladder to also knowing that your bladder your bladder is a muscle in itself you don't have to squeeze from the outside your bladder is is it's an involuntary muscle you don't have to do anything your bladder you can literally sit on the loo for 20 seconds and do absolutely nothing when you urinate it should be a wonderful experience because especially if you're at home you yeah. can just sit and do absolutely nothing you breathe and that is a and you shouldn't have to push your urine out mm. yeah. i love peeing it's like i love it almost as much as sneezing it's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so so yeah, we, we, it's also bladder habits and, and, and all these reflexes and the way that our brain communicate, communicates with our bladder and our pelvic floor. It's, it's quite a complex, different system. And Absolutely. there can be different areas that we focus on, but essentially we need to make sure that we are 
completely filling our bladder and we are completely emptying our bladder yeah. in order to maintain this good function and then also being able to connect your pelvic floor while you're doing so. Yeah. And it goes back to what you, you, you keep on reminding us that being aware, like being connected, if you're listening to your body, then you will know when it's time to go and you'll know when it's time to release, but only obviously if you've interrupted those patterns, you do need to see a professional, but like for somebody who may be like for me, for example, other people might resonate with this. When you're stuck in work and you spend all day sitting and you need to pee, but you just want to finish this thing and then you get stuck into yeah. it again. I'm very bad at multitasking. I can forget about needing to pee until I am like, I've got to get up this second and I've got to go, like, do not stop me. Like that's, yeah. that's rubbish. I know that's bad of me. And I'm sitting here drinking water, drinking water, ignoring my body saying, Hey, we kind of need to pee. Hey, we need to pee. Mm. A few <laughs> minutes later, Hey, we need to pee. And I'm like, okay. I'm just, I'm just ignoring that function. Like it just yeah. comes back to listening, treating your body with respect. It's more complex than we realize, and it deserves to be answered. The call of nature deserves to be answered. <laughs> so just looking after yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? This, this connection and this, this awareness of these different areas, um, one, because I know you're also interested in sexual function. So all of these things are, are impacting your sexual function. So when I've got patients that are you know, have overfull incontinence or have urge incontinence, which is what you just spoke about now, or patients that have um, constipation, mm -hmm. all of these symptoms impact your sexual function. Okay. So we need to, you know, we need to think of things holistically, just like when we say, you know, we need to think of, of bladder function. We need to think about that holistically. We need to consider, like if you were a patient, I would consider that your working environment, I would consider, you know, mm. the restrictions that you might have, you know, I'm not going to go tell you to sit on a toilet which I think other public physios will absolutely hate me for. Oh. I am not in any way, shape or form going to sit on a public toilet. Um, so I can't tell my patients to do so. So oh. I need to consider these different things. I need to consider if you're a germaphobe and just like we're being holistic with that, we also need to be holistic with, with sexual function and, and mm -hmm. identify that if there is another function, if you've got a sore foot, mm -hmm. if you've got a open mosquito bite on your foot, that's going to impact your, your sexual function because you're going to be distracted and you're not going to be able to be aware and be present in mm. your pelvic floor. If you've got constipation, same thing. It's going to impact your pelvic floor's ability to relax and let it go. It's going to impact your sensation. Oh, I could go on for days. Oh, we are <laughs> all connected. We're like this one beautiful, connective, complicated structure. Yeah, I love it. Oh, I've learned well. so much today, Candice. Thank you very much. Like I thought I knew a lot about, you know, the vagina. There's a lot that I didn't <laughs> Oh, especially yeah. for me, mind blown by the way our organs are suspended. <laughs> <laughs> they're not just plopped in me like floating around. I don't they're know very... what I thought. I honestly don't know what I thought. I didn't really think about it. And I usually do consider these things. So yeah, that's, it's been amazing. You don't know what you don't know. No one's told you. <laughs> now I know. I'm going to tell everybody that I meet today. Yeah, Everyone's going to learn. <laughs> um, so we've shared your Instagram handle, which is at Nurture Your Vagina. Where else can people find you? How can you help them? Like, what can people do next if they want to know more about you? Um, so I'm also on Facebook. So Facebook is uh, Nurture Pelvic Floor Physio. Mm -hmm. um, they don't like the word vagina, so I couldn't use that. And then <laughs> my website also used to have the word vagina, but I, it kept on getting spammed and kind of considered as porn. Mm. So uh, that is nurturepelvichealth.com um, is my website, nurturepelvichealth.com. And that's where there is, um, that's where I do like a sexual health webinar, which is, which has been made available now to, to purchase as, as like a, it, I suppose it's an elaboration of what, of what we've done now, but focusing more yeah. on sex and sexual function. Um, okay. So yeah, those are, those would be my, my three main platforms on, on Instagram, Facebook, and then the website, nurturepelvichealth.com. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm so grateful that there are people like you in the world educating in such like a non awkward way. Just say it as it is. <laughs> it's really helpful. <laughs> I just love your posts. I just think you're, you're really making a change and it's fantastic. I'm happy to have connected with you. So thank you for Thanks. your time today. I know you're very busy, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. It's, it's been a pleasure to sit and chat with you. It's been enjoyable at the same <laughs> time. So it's been nice to 
a break in the day. To <laughs> yeah, that always know. helps. <laughs> Eager to talk about pleasure and periods and all the things. <laughs> all the things that begin with P. And even, I'm sure that... Um, your nurture your vagina could have been changed to a P, but that would have been even more upsetting to Facebook. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, I think I think I'm I'm really pushing my luck as it is. <laughs> <laughs> the posts that I make and the things I talk about, the conversations that I start, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really we're really on the edge. <laughs> we are on the edge. Instagram is like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if we want to educate people on this stuff, you know. <laughs> It's going to overturn the patriarchy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Candice. And I look forward to chatting to you again soon. Yeah, thank you, love. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>